what you ask. Um, but it's something new, and, and we really thought about um, whether we um, should begin with this notion of land acknowledgement. And, and we ask you to do some homework. Um, and we decided um, to engage every morning in a land acknowledgement. So what is a land acknowledgement? It may be new for some of us. It may be um, something that we have been participating in uh, as we took the stand of the learner again and participated in last summer was the Speak Up Institute. It was the first time I was introduced to land acknowledgement. And this year we went to Encore and every session started with the land acknowledgement. And we have a group of faculty here at Arcadia who attended Encore, which is the conference we went, and who really dig deep into how to create a land acknowledgement that recognizes the land that Arcadia occupies. So because we are not at Arcadia, we ask you to engage in a little bit of research to make sure that this land acknowledgement is not just a performative exercise. Is, uh, and we, we wonder whether we wanted to do it. And Ellen and I are part, and many of you are too, part of a, um, a higher education collective on Facebook. And um, individuals with Native American faculty members um, we are asked the question, how do you feel about starting meetings with land acknowledgement? So we want to bring their voices and they said, it is just a good first step. It's just a good first step, but we need to go deeper. And that's why you received learning who, from where, where you live in the moment, where you are at the moment, who, which land are you occupying? This is with the concept of decolonizing, right? Like making visible the colonization that took place. Um, so which land are you acknowledging? And what does it mean? What group, what do we know about their norms, etc.? So I'm going to do for the first time, I'm going to share my screen um, with this uh, land acknowledgement that I'm borrowing from the work that was done um, by a group of colleagues, some of whom are here. I see Alison and I don't know who else is here um, to try to begin to define something for Arcadia University, um, which is the beginning step because now um, Fabian and another group of, of faculty are in conversations with the Lenape people to co-create the land acknowledgement, to bring their voices and their experiences that could be really included and represented when we acknowledge the land at Arcadia University. So why have a land acknowledgement? For non-Indigenous people, this practice is a way to show respect Hopefully it's working to show respect for the indigenous people who once live on this land we now occupy. It is also a way to recognize the rich history of indigenous peoples. We also need to make sure that it's not performative. If you're going to introduce a land acknowledgement statement to your class, I would advise you to discuss American Indians, history, contemporary, social problems, etc., depending on how it gels with your discipline or what you would like to bring. And only expose that our students have to these people is through professional and college sports. And that is, uh, I'm using this language and I'm not sure what uh, that meant, but what I want to um, share with you is what this is the draft or the beginning version of Arcadia University land acknowledgement example. 
We would like to acknowledge the land that Arcadia University occupies is the ancestral lands of the Lenape people. We take this opportunity to recognize their connection to this land and their resilience in the face of colonialism. And I'm going to stop sharing. I wonder if there are any questions and if we could take a few minutes for you to put on the chat the land acknowledgement that you were able to find. Where are you joining us from? And I'm going to take this time to read what the chat says. And again, I know that they are, I'm, I'm seeing Alison and, and maybe Christopher were part of crafting this. If there is anything you would like to add, um, that would be wonderful. Yeah, Mark, that's a really interesting one. I just um, shared in the chat a, um, a piece that was done on WHYY this uh, weekend, actually, about um, the Lenape and how they did, they, right, as you say here, land ownership was not a part of their um, practice. Yeah, they were, they, were real, they were really clear about that when they wrote, wrote to us about it. Okay. So Graciela, are you asking people to- If you the... want to, yeah. If you feel comfortable writing on the chat where you are like um, Glenside, PA, the land of the Lenape people. I, I will do that. Um, so we have a way of saying it, Glenside, PA, the land of the Lenape. And here we are thinking, I know we have people joining us from Europe, right? Like from uh, the UK. And, uh, and here we are exposing some of the cultural differences and how inclusive or exclusive may be when we have international students and they are learning, but not directly participating from this. Mark, in your conversations or the ones that you've heard of, is saying it's the land of the Lenape people, something that they don't. Mm. Yeah, and we're happy to send forward the language and their, their note to us, and they are going to engage us. Um, thank you, Fabian, for his leadership and Doreen around this um, and others. But the they said they never owned the land. That's their philosophy, is that, and so to acknowledge that they, um, that they are sort of uh, the language I'll look for. There's like a very specific word that they were using, but it was like watching over the land, making sure it's, you know, it's healthy and the, the, land, the land watched over by the Lenape people. Yeah, yeah, it's like the I, I can look up the I'll look up the email now and I'll, I'll, I'll cut and paste the language and but um stewards of the land. Uh -huh. Stewards of the land. That's so interesting. Yeah. Great. You're right because that whole idea of land ownership um, is culturally bound too, right? Like, Yes, Alison, and that is the question. How are we supporting? How are we interacting? How are we? Um, it's not just the mentioning. That's why there is some debate about whether this is um, should be done or not. And it was the response we heard from the participants and faculty member who are um, indigenous people who said, yes, start there, but don't end there. So that's why we're starting. That was um, highlighted in, in one of the um, statements that was forwarded to us that Mark is referring to as well, um, and that, you know, it's talking about the building that relationship as well. So it's not just, you know, this is the land, this is the history of the land and the indigenous population, but also how can we support that indigenous population in, in our work and in, as an institution. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that there's been some conversation with Lenape leaders and 
that was one of the things Allison I really loved about the WHYY article is like seeing how um, people in the region who um, are advocating for themselves and how we might become part of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you to all of you who share. This is, again, this is new. We are um, learning about it, learning about how to, every time we'll do it in a, in a better way, more inclusive, more respectful, and moving away from performance. But we wanted to introduce this to you all. I thought, we thought it was important both as a practice and, and as something to consider to include in, in your teaching. Um, so Ellen, I yeah. think... Um, okay, here we go. Are we ready to, um, to dive in? I, I just want to remind people a little bit about the schedule. We're going to spend like the next 35 minutes sort of setting the, the framework for the week and um, how we're thinking about the work that we're going to do together. And again, just acknowledging that um, it's the beginning um, and not the end. Um, we won't be finished um, by the end of this week. Um, and also just to say that then at, um, at 1030, um, we're going to be um, doing some work in breakout rooms to really begin to think about our own practices in our classrooms and in our um, syllabi. Um, and then the final, we're going to take a break at 1120. And then <clears throat> from 1130 to 1230, it's really going to be time for people to actually work on syllabi with with each other. And so you'll have the option to sort of choose breakout rooms where there are going to be other people who are going to actually be, you know, we, we had some um, get stuff done days um, over the past year. And it's really the concept of a kind of working session, a, a session where we're um, creating space for each other to spend an hour sort of thinking about the work that we've started today and how that might have an impact on some dimension of um, one of the syllabi that you're going to be using um, in the fall. Um, so anyway, just set, setting that up. This is the setup moment. And ordinarily throughout the week, this 9.30 to 10.30 portion is going to be students and alumni um, giving their perspectives on what do you wish faculty knew <laughs> about how to best support you in the classroom. Um, and um, most days, I think, showing a video of what students across the country are saying they wish faculty knew. Um, and then um, each day from 10.30 to 11.30 after today, um, that will be the time when we have a speaker coming to, to help lead us in some conversation from an area of um, their own experience and expertise. So just to start, I wanna say, um, it's fantastic to have you here. And I wanna just sort of let you know that one of the reasons why this is called um, redesigning your syllabi for inclusive excellence or redesigning your syllabus for inclusive excellence is that when um, the adaptive strategy for Arcadia was created, um, there was a sense that Arcadia needs to have a framework for inclusive excellence. And this is connected to the American Association for Colleges and Universities, AACNU, um, their work on inclusive excellence um, across the country. Um, as we've been thinking about that, there's also been a fair amount of critique about the term inclusive excellence. Um, and so I want to just acknowledge that um, and uh, say that recently when we were talking about this work with the president's cabinet, um, I mentioned that we were thinking about changing um, the term. And um, Ajay said, so tell me more about that. Why, why not inclusive excellence? And I said, you know, I think there's a feeling on campus that we're not talking about a new tablecloth for the table. We're talking about a new table. <laughs> um, and does, does the term inclusive excellence imply that it's the same table, but we have a new tablecloth? <laughs> and, do, and instead, do we really need to be building a new table? Um, and then as Graciela and I have been planning, we've been talking about like, who gets to sit at the table and which table, <laughs> right? So this metaphor of a table has come up. Um, so just so you know, we're using the term inclusive excellence um, this week. Um, we're engaging with conversations um, with multiple stakeholders and particularly with the ABRI curricular infusion team about um, how this work 
is directly connected to the decolonizing your syllabus work that's been happening this um, summer and is ongoing, and that the language may shift as, as we figure out how do we talk about the work we're doing. And so I wanna just say that for me, a huge part of the work that we're trying to do is to shift from thinking about our courses and our syllabi as being primarily about content and instead thinking that they're primarily about learning and learners, right? Um, and there's a lot of great work that's been happening recently, a lot of it from other campuses that are trying to create frameworks for inclusive excellence where every student is um, welcomed and um, that the kinds of learning that's happening in the classroom um, really allow them to participate fully. Um, that this shift from a sort of content-centered uh, syllabus to a more learning or learner-centered syllabus is a huge part of that work. Um, and I wanna just say that um, I, I had a chance to be with some colleagues last week and someone from Fresno State regularly does a workshop. She's a biologist herself and she, she regularly does a workshop with faculty that's called Beyond the Tyranny of Content. <laughs> um, and so that's not our title, but um, <laughs> I think there's a little bit of that spirit um, in what we're saying. Um, and that's a big shift. I just wanna acknowledge, I acknowledged earlier that I think one of the, one of the reasons that those of us who get into um, higher ed, get into higher ed is that we're really interested in understanding things deeply, right? And and then wanting to share what we understand deeply. And I'll admit it, like also really enjoying knowing things. Um, and my dog is now participating, um, not just in this meeting, but in the recording of this meeting. So his name is Zoomer. Um, so um, maybe I'm gonna pause here for just a second. Um, and Graciela, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, like how we want to function this week in terms of, and then I'll share the framework that we're gonna be using as we go through the week and asking questions um, of our, oh, I think he's staying upstairs, so I'm gonna keep talking. Um, so I'm gonna share right now, um, uh, you all got the, um, you all got um, in your, your invite, um, the document uh, called, um, Inclusion by Design, um, which is a, a framework that some uh, folks at multiple universities have been working on. And it's on, I've been looking at different universities' inclusive excellence um, resources, and many people are using this as a tool. One of the things that Graciela and I really like about it um, is that it um, it's focuses on questions um, and not on do this, do this, do this, but it's, it's a, something to help you ask questions of your syllabus, right? Um, and that feels like a really important um, shift for us, not to be thinking, oh, I need to do this and I need to do this, but like, huh, how am I doing this? And is this happening? And what choices have I made in this area? So I'm gonna share a screen again quickly, just to walk you through. I, I, one of the things that Graciela and I really want is for us to use this framework, but also to add things to it, right? And to question it and to say, I think this question could be phrased in a different way. And you'll actually see already as um, we made this Padlet that um, I've already, we, Graciela and I have already changed some of the language or added a question that we feel goes deeper. And in a lot of cases, the reason for doing that is to make a stronger connection to the ABRI work that's happening on campus and the decolonizing your syllabus work that's happening on campus. So what you'll see um, in this, for those of you who haven't used a Padlet before, um, just under the title, you'll see that the original document is there. So if you don't like this format and you wanna go back to the document that has more sort of like a checklist um, and places where you can rate yourself in terms of how learning and learner-centered um, your syllabus is, feel free to do that. But I also wanna just show you that for any of the the categories, right? And this tool uses three big or overarching categories. It talks about inclusion and in the context of your course. It talks about multiple dimensions of inclusion and text. Um, so frame and tone, 
um, learning objectives, um, assessment, teaching activities, all of those things. Um, and then if you go along the bottom here, you'll see that the final section is called inclusion and subtext. And that really focuses on the hidden curriculum, right? What kinds of biases are there, your teaching philosophy, implicit messages. So one of the nice things about having this framework in a Padlet is at any point you could make a comment about a particular um, area. You'll see, I'm trying to think there's one here, Graciela was talking about getting some feedback in her classes about um, different perspectives and like whose perspective, like if she gives a point of view, is that the only point of view in the classroom? Um, and so we added a little comment there. Um, most of you, if you don't have Padlet accounts, your comments will be, um, your comments will be anonymous um, unless you add your name. Um, so you can decide whether you want people to know um, your comments. And then in a few cases, as I said, one of the things we like about this tool is that it's asking questions, right? It's saying like, you know, to what extent does the format of the course material respond to a broad range of learning preferences, written text, visual and audio, media preferences, et cetera, right? So that's a question that you could ask of your syllabus. Um, so we wanna encourage people, there are a couple of things we wanna encourage. We wanna encourage people to add questions, add critique, add those kinds of things. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing this is that CTLM has been asked to sort of create a framework for and with the university for building um, more inclusive excellence. Um, you'll also see that here in the terms of what's missing, um, I looked through some of the fantastic resources that have been collected by our colleagues um, um, in the Decolonizing Your Syllabus workshops this summer. Um, and there's one here that I really liked because it also includes questions for you to ask of your syllabus. Um, in the tool itself, there's a, there are a couple of places where ABRI intersects. There's here where it talks about culturally responsive teaching. The activity we're gonna do today is um, together in breakout rooms has to do with hot moments in the classroom and how we manage um, teachable and hot moments. Um, and then um, you'll see that over here on the very right of the Padlet, if there are other resources you wanna add, like I included the FAQs from our own Disability Services Center here. Um, so it's possible for you at any time to sort of click on this and, and add a resource, resource that you think is um, super helpful, okay? Um, so what we're, our hope is, is that when you go into your final um, breakout rooms today, that you'll choose sort of one section of this to, to sort of ask some questions of your syllabus, right? Whether that have to do with context or text. Um, um, Dan Shaw will be happy. There's some good stuff here about learning objectives and whether they line up um, with what you're actually doing. Um, so you, you'll have some choices about which dimensions you're gonna focus in on um, each day. And we've asked the presenters who are gonna be presenting to also be thinking about in what ways are, are what they're sharing with us, how, how do those intersect with some of the questions we might be asking um, of our syllabi. Um, anything else we wanna, oh, I, I guess one last thing I'll add and then I'll, I'll ask um, others, um, Graciela if, uh, first, if they wanna add anything. And that is, one of the other um, frameworks that we're going to be um, thinking a lot about as we do this work is Carol Dweck's distinguished distinction between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. Um, and the growth mindset work really lines up with a learning or learner centered syllabus right it's really about helping students learn how to learn right um, it's not primarily about um, remembering content right but it's um, the, the famous thing that she talks about is, um, uh, I don't know how to do that yet, um, is a very common um, way of thinking about it. And actually, in my daughter's soccer program, that's something they really focus on growth mindset. Like, it's not that, it's this idea that we aren't all born with inherent skills, like we either have the talent or we don't, but that we all have the capacity to learn and grow, and that that learning and growing has to include 
like the opportunity to make mistakes and to try something out um, and then try it again, right? Um, and so in higher ed, that's not always the most common mindset that we have, but it's one that feels super important to our ability to really meet students where they are and also to create really vibrant learning communities where people um, are able to make mistakes, right? That, that the strongest kind of learning we do is when we aren't trying to play it safe, um, but we say, oh, I'm gonna try this new thing, I'm gonna take a risk. And that helps us learn something um, more powerfully and also more deeply. Um, Graciela, do you want to um, say anything more there? I think this is great. Um, we are going to become more familiar with it as we use it and, um, and to just regroup and say that um, there are conversations, discussions, small group at the half of or more than half. And then the, we, we understand that many of you, and we saw what you commented on, your, uh, on the survey, that you want to leave with, this, with your syllabus work done. So there will be time to put all of this hands-on sitting. We're just setting the tone, sharing resources, tools that we thought may be helpful, but we are going to have time for you to go back to your, your syllabus, look at it, um, maybe hopefully use this tool, but not necessarily whatever works with you with all the resources. That was a way of breaking down that um, rubric on how inclusive your syllabus is. Um, and then we added, we thought that maybe we want to have lunch together and continue the conversation and share um, with each other the, the practical work of putting this onto our syllabus. Um, one last thing I just want to share is that um, one of the hardest things about planning for this week was just how much, how many resources there are. <laughs> and so one of the commitments that we are trying to make is that even though there are lots of tools, we're trying to have one tool that becomes our central tool that we return to and we add to and we critique. And that um, one of, some of the feedback that we've been hearing for people is that it can just feel overwhelming. Like, what are some of the first steps I, I could take or I, I might take or I should take? And so one of our goals in having you focus on one syllabus <laughs> um, and one of the goals of us using this tool throughout the week is to try to make it so it's not a, just a lot of um, opening of new tabs and oh, maybe, here's this new idea and this new idea, but actually some time to really think about how might I incorporate more of this um, into my coursework. Um, and I guess the other thing we wanna say, we're using the term syllabus in its broadest definition. We're not just talking about the piece of paper, <laughs> right? Um, we're talking about sort of the, the structure, the design um, of our courses, the sort of contract that we have with students in our courses and how we navigate that and um, sometimes co-facilitate aspects of its development with students. Um, that we're talking, we're using syllabus kind of with a capital S, right? The, the living, breathing document that helps to frame the learning that happens in our courses. Okay, do we want to switch over now to um, some of the video framing resources that we have um, for today, Graciela? Sure. Um, are there any questions before we do a little bit of a shift? Any comments, reaction, questions beyond what was posted on the chat? So I will take that as a no. Um, the way in which we want to, we are thinking about one way to approach this work is to always think about um, the work we are doing um, at the individual level of how we interact with the students and our students interact with each other, um, and also a systemic level. And a word, that the, a word that keeps coming, and you heard it many times and we're going to keep thinking about, has to do with privilege, right? As we are, organizing our syllabus, we are thinking about the visible and invisible ways in which some of our students have a certain advantage, unearned advantage, just because of their 
social and cultural identities. Um, some of you mentioned that you're interested in, in learning how to support our first generation students. As you know, at the undergraduate level, 35% of Arcadia students are first generation students. And that means um, a lot of things. It means that um, they don't have the privilege, perhaps, of having parents or, or people in their um, group, um, unpaid professionals, to help them, give them advice, give them um, knowledge, transmit knowledge that students who have families or, or siblings or other individuals who, who have been to college and can talk to them about um, something that um, we call um, we call um, the hidden agenda. And just to illuminate this, to illustrate this, um, I'm going to show with you show you a video. Um, it's a 12 minute video uh, done, oh, done by a professor at Harvard that really, sheds a light onto the opportunities that many of our students are missing because they don't have that understanding of the hidden curriculum, uh, of the ways in which we expect students to know certain things, but unless they are part of the network of understanding how things work or they have the prior experience they are missing out and we are not aware of that so i'm going to start by sharing this video call i'm going to put it on the chat um, this video call access and inclusion and i have shared it in several places so you may have seen it already um, but i think this is a good place to start to begin to think about um, digging deeper into what it means to be a, not to know or to not know what is happening. So I'm looking for the share screen. Um, here it is. Are you seeing my video at the moment? Yes, okay. Yes. Um, what I didn't do, sorry. I haven't taught in a while. I'm going to stop sharing and make sure I um, optimize for um, video so the sound comes out well. Optimize for video. Here we go. I remember the first time I stepped foot on the Amherst College campus. It was with my mother and brother. We drove up from Miami. The flights were too expensive, and besides, we were all afraid of flying anyway. We pulled up to Pratt dorm, got out of the car, <sighs> took deep breaths of fresh country air, but then my brother starts to laugh. He saw a little critter run across the yard. He said, Tony, Y'all pay how much for school here and y'all got rats? <laughs> y'all, it was a chipmunk. <laughs> we had never seen a real one before. His joke barely hid his excitement. It did nothing for his nerves. We were in another world. So yeah, me, here, a Harvard professor in an opera house? <laughs> it's a testament to the fact that even undreamt dreams come true. <laughs> I'm the proud son of a middle school security guard, the brother of a janitor, both hardworking but neither college educated. I'm from a poor, segregated community in Miami that even my local newspaper called a place time forgot. There are often more struggles and celebrations. High school was the finish line. 
When I was growing up, there were only three Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. And the only reason why Princeton makes the list is because of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> but such is the pernicious power of poverty. It isolates and it separates. It creates two worlds occupied by the haves and the have-nevers. So much so that people equate poor students like myself making it into college as having made it. The golden ticket not to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, but to those bastions of power and privilege. Yet getting in is only half the battle. Colleges, like many organizations, have invested millions in diversity recruitment, but have thought less about what to do when students arrive on campus. Access ain't inclusion. Part of the reason why is because colleges get their new diversity from old sources. My research is the first to show that colleges get half of their poor black students from boarding and day schools. One third of Latinos are too. I call these students the privileged poor. Colleges like poor students from private schools because they have cultural capital those taken for granted ways of being that are valued in mainstream institutions. The other poor black and Latino students attend local, typically distressed public schools. They don't enter with the same cultural capital. I call these students the doubly disadvantaged. It was my interviews with 103 undergraduates that show how poverty and inequality stopped those who made it. You see, when students enter college, whether a community college or an Ivy League institution, they encounter a hidden curriculum, a system of unwritten rules and unsaid expectation. Professors throw around class terms like office hours, yet they only say when they are. They never say what they are. You see, colleges expect students to be comfortable engaging faculty. I mean, this is the role to recommendation letters. It's the road to emotional support when times gets rough. Connecting with faculty is even valuable for your GPA. One research project showed that each visit to office hours corresponds with a 1.25% bump in your final grade for that course. Yet, this expectation goes unsaid. There's no manuals of do's or don'ts, when's or how's. And unspoken, if undergraduates want something, they will come operates as the gold ticket the college corollary to the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Imagine the culture shock then that the doubly disadvantaged experience. It was otherworldly for Valeria, a lower income student from the Midwest. Her teachers spent more time maintaining order than making connections. She entered college believing in the American dream. She believed that her advancement should be about the work. It was how her father saw the world. It was also how he told her to see it as well. Mija, you don't want to get ahead by kissing ass, right? You want it based on hard work. It'll take longer, Mija, but you'll feel more proud. Let us not be quick to label this father's advice as bad. In 2016, a dean from Dean College reached out to me. She wanted to know how could she increase academic engagement among her lower income students. I said, let's start with something basic. Let's define office hours. Something I said resonated with her. When she finally asked her students why they didn't visit her in office hours, they said, miss, we thought that was your time to do your work in your office undisturbed. It's a reasonable assumption to make. Something was lost in translation that had nothing to do with English proficiency. But let us remember the privileged poor, those alumni of prep schools where contact with faculty is not only encouraged, but built into the structure of the place. Students like Agoon. A reflective Latina, Agoon hails from a troubled neighborhood but attended a New England boarding school. She was taught in high school by PhDs. PhDs were also dorm parents. She entered college feeling entitled to talk to a professor and say, hey, I wanna meet with you. My high school told me I can do that. It's actually my right. 
Even when her professor was away from campus, she had no qualms calling him for virtual office hours despite friends' surprise looks. Undergraduates from America's forgotten neighborhoods and ignored schools are truly disadvantaged if colleges continue to privilege privilege. We cannot assume that all students have had a chance to practice, let alone master these skills before they arrive on campus. And as office hours in college become open door policies at work, this process, it can continue. We wonder why we can hire diverse applicants, but we can't seem to promote them. Recommendation letters in college are dependent upon relationships with faculty, just as promotion at work is dependent upon relationships with superiors. For me, I went to Gulliver Prep and learned how to navigate office hours similar to Agum. I got those letters of recommendation, one even coming from the college president. I learned that it's not just what you know and who you know, but also about who knows you and how well they do. But I am not so naive. The stumbling blocks to inclusion are not merely social. Colleges take for granted not just what students know, but also what they can afford. Sometimes the very policies that colleges implement hurt, the, hurt all lower income students, the privileged poor and the doubly disadvantaged alike. College's decision to shut down during spring break, assuming that all people can leave for fun in the sun, is a case in point. But what if you can't go home? Or what if you don't have a home to go to? Or what about for you if hurt and home are synonymous? Campus, for better or for worse, is your refuge. Yet professors flee and friends leave. Buildings close. They even turn down the heat in the dorms. You walk past the cafeteria and the lights are out and the chairs, they're stacked on top of the tables. You walk past the cafeteria and the lights are out. You literally can still though see the plates and trays, the forks and knives through the fence that bar you from entry. It comes as no surprise why poor students like Ariana call spring break the real Hunger Games. But just how close it comes to living in the districts is downright depressing. When campuses close, students come back food insecurity, not knowing where their next meal is coming from. Sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures. You know, I attended a conference for first generation college students. And I met a young woman. She was white, witty, and wore her hair in a pixie haircut. She had on a blue Columbia University sweatshirt. She, she stood brave in the room to discuss how she spent her last spring break at one of the most wealthiest colleges in the country. She increased her online dating activity the week before spring break to secure dates the following week. Banking on gender norms of older men paying for the first meal, she treated OkCupid as if it was DoorDash. <laughs> she treated Tinder as if it was Grubhub. Outpriced and overextended, she offered her time. This makes no sense. But this is a reality for many students across the country. Two out of every five undergraduates in America are food insecure. Instead of investing time learning linear algebra, many invest their times making ends meet. You know, the question of if diversity is worth it is ever present. And not just at colleges, but at organizations of all stripes. The answer is yes, it is. But we should not be surprised 
when certain new groups struggle. These unwritten rules and injurious hurdles don't just trip them up. It keeps them on the outs. We must move from access to inclusion. And data will help in this endeavor. I've shared with you just two issues that undercut diversity's efforts. The hidden curriculum and food insecurity. There are many more, both social and structural in nature. So I'll leave y'all with this. What else do we take for granted? Thank you.